Well, thanks for having me. I'm glad I could be here. Um, so the first two talks were kind of big picture and, and really got into the nuts and bolts about uh, yields and, and production systems and nitrogen cycling. And it's, it's uh, my job to kind of break apart some of the, the components of this and get into the details of, of, of you know, nitrogen cycling, particularly as these cover crops are decomposing. So just kind of breaking down what's going on under the hood. So we'll just walk through this together. So first, I think it's important to, to identify what we're trying to do with cover crops and where we're going. This is a, this is a qualitative schematic of, of what can be achieved as you increase your biomass, both the quality and the quantity. But this continuum pretty much applies across the board. This, these really small cover crops provide some advantage in the case of erosion. But if we start to target other services in the system, we got to push the performance of the cover crop. Most of what we were hearing in that last talk, a lot of those, the, those that data sets were real small cover crops, and it was when we got into those bigger cover crops where we saw some interactions with the nitrogen or some potential other factors. And so that's what I'm going to kind of break apart is one, what's going on with these small cover crops, but as we start to target more and more services and push what we can do with cover crops, how do we get there with management and how does that management interact with the performance of the cover crops in the system? So this is a simple schematic on, on lots of different management factors affect cover crops. So all of these different factors, planting methods, site-specific management, nutrient inputs, the genetics of the cover crop, all these factors affect the degree in which the cover crop performs. And I think it's important to define performance. So performance is there's this intrinsic effect, right, which is just climate and soil. At any one given site, the climate and the soil is going to drive the potential performance of that cover crop, its quality and its quantity. And then management influences the degree in which you achieve that optimum, right? There's some management out there that achieves the optimal cover crop performance, and then there's degrees of management that occur that are below that optimal, and so where you are in that spectrum affects the degree in which that cover crop performs. And as we increase our management intensity around cover crops, they're going to do more for us in the landscape. And that's, that's part of the, the premise of this talk. So legumes, we've heard a little bit about them uh, earlier. They fix nitrogen, right? They have a very high tissue end content. So they have these low CN ratios, right? Below 25 to 1, often 18 to 1. They decompose rapidly. Um, they're not very good at, at reducing leaching and nitrogen uh, management in, in these systems. They are adding new nitrogen. But compared to mineral photos, they do have a slower release, right? Not as slow as you think, and that's going to be one of the points of my talk, is that legumes actually disintegrate quite rapidly. Uh, but they have a lower energy use, right? You're, you're, you're fixing nitrogen in place. Mineral fertilizer is very, fertilizers are very energy intensive to produce. Legumes are growing that nitrogen in place, so it's a less energy requirements to renewable resource. And then obviously the advantages over animal waste here, not adding phosphorus and the transport costs, volatility. So now I'm going to switch gears and, and talk about, just give you an example of how, how management interacts with that performance. And that's going to be the theme. I'm going to kind of go back and forth, management, performance, and then I'm going to break apart how they are re releasing and decomposing in the environment. So this is a study that we're doing up and down the East Coast right here. That, uh, that actually, it's been finished for a number of years. So you can see from Massachusetts, New York, Pennsylvania, this is where I am down here in Maryland, North Carolina. We do grow corn over there on that part of the country. And uh, so this was a uh, study where we were planting hairy vetch cover crops uh, following uh, a corn into a hairy vetch cover crop. And we wanted to look at how management combines across this latitudinal gradient and see how that affects the ability for the cover crop to perform and the subsequent corn yield. And so let's break this apart. And this is why I didn't want to stand over here. I knew I was going to leave at some point. They said the camera works over here still, so I can stand right here. So this is a figure that we're seeing. Here's Massachusetts, New York, Pennsylvania, Maryland, North Carolina. And these are just different years, year one, year two, year three. And there's a lot more data that we collected in here, but I just took a little slice of it to make a point. So Massachusetts, it's cold. North Carolina, it's hot. Across that north to south gradient, you can see some striking effects. This is a seeding rate gradient. So this is hairy vetch seeding rate. I'm sorry I didn't convert those units, but that's pretty much just pounds per acre. They work out about the same. So we're typically recommending seeding rates in here, right? 25 to 30 pounds per acre is the common seeding rate for hairy vetch, typically in our region. Well, as you can see in this, in this figure, that 
That's not necessary in these southern climates. And you go down to North Carolina, they're getting away in Maryland down to five to 10 pounds per acre of hairy vetch seed is enough to reach maximum biomass. And then another take home point is that, we look, at the look at the maximum biomass here in North Carolina, Maryland, or Pennsylvania that gets up there. New York and Massachusetts don't even come close to that, right? So their, their biomass potential is not as high. The amount of biomass they can produce is not as high. They need to compensate with seeding costs. So you can see this increasing seeding costs to get higher. Oh, and I, I left out one other detail, I'm sorry. These are optimal and late uh, um, planting. So this is planting in the fall. So we planted this hairy vest in the fall. The solid line represents the optimal planting date, and the late one here is the dashed. So the idea was that can you, in a late planting, if you increase your seeding rate, can you compensate for your biomass production? And the point here is simple. And if you're in a northern climate, you're planting a legume, you're going to produce less biomass, it takes more seed to get there, so the overall cost is increased. The seed costs are increased, and your potential biomass is decreased, so the overall dollars per pounds of nitrogen is much higher. And this just gives you a sense of what that plant available nitrogen looks like. So if you're up in this upper tier here like North Carolina, you can get about 100 pounds per acre of plant available nitrogen. If you're down here in this lower tier here like Massachusetts, you're gonna get about 18 to 30 pounds per nitrogen. That's during the growing season in corn. So that just highlights the interaction between your climate, your soil, and your management timing and how that interacts to, to affect that performance. Now here's the grasses. Grasses we heard a lot about earlier today. They're heavy nitrogen scavengers, right? They grow fast biomass. They're very winter hardy. It's the dominant cover crop we see across the landscape. Am I blocking y'all pretty much? No? Okay, good. All right. So that, this is what we see mostly across the landscape is these grasses. And that's because they're good for nitrogen scavenging and preventing erosion. That's been the primary early adoption as we're now at conferences all about soil health and we're pushing that soil health agenda. Or as we see more and more herbicide resistant weeds become a problem in our region, we start to look for cover crops for other services. And then we got to push the management and increase the biomass. So this just gives you a sense of what kind of biomass ranges are out there. So this is grass at the tillery stage all the way to anthesis. Tillering stage is what is just what it is in the spring. So it starts to tiller out in the, in the fall. In the spring before it elongates, that's the tillering stage. It can produce a lot of tillers. It can produce a little bit of tillers. That's the tillering stage. And you can see on a poor sandy soil with low fertility, that's what you can expect, 300 to 700 pounds per acre. On a very highly fertile site, you might get up to 1,500 you know, pounds per acre. Of, but you can see the ranges once you go all the way up to flowering. So pretty straightforward. You delay management, you get more biomass. What comes with more of that biomass is you also have differences of the carbon to nitrogen ratio. So that tillering stage, look at that, that's 18. That's not much higher than a legume. The legume, regardless of the stage in which you kill it and the biomass produced, its CN ratios are pretty constant. Whereas you can see the change in the CN ratio in the grasses, that as it gets more mature, it builds up more carbon, it has less nitrogen to for total biomass. And that affects how it behaves in the landscape. And it gets at these questions that we were hearing about earlier about nitrogen management when corn following cereal rye or barley or triticale, whichever cover crop we were looking at. But this also just gives you a sense of performance, where you fit in this spectrum. If you're a high fertility site, low fertility site, when you kill it, this is kind of the range of biomass you're gonna achieve. So let's look at a study now with these grasses and, 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 and see how this, the implications of this timing of management. So here's this, we're gonna have, an, we have a no cover crop treatment and we have an early termination and we have a uh, late termination. I'm pushing the boundaries here, aren't I? Okay, there we go. I won now. All right, so uh, this is early termination and late termination. You can see the differences in the CN ratios. You can see uh, that this early termination, it behaves a lot like a legume. It's a very low carbon to nitrogen ratio. It's releasing and decomposing quite rapidly. This idea that, that a small little cover crop is gonna have a lot of nitrogen immobilization, is, it's, it's not a big driver. It's when you start to get to these bigger cover crops, these small little cover crops that are out there that look like this, they have a very low CN to ratio, to ratio. They're releasing that nitrogen rapidly, probably so rapidly, well before you're planting your cash crop, that it's almost out of the system, that nitrogen. So let's look at the profile here in the spring. 
So this is a, a field, this isn't a long-term cropping systems experiment that have a belt spill. Maryland. And here you have no cover crop, early kill and late kill cover crops. This is a corn soybean rotation, continuous corn soybean, got it replicated five times. And you're just seeing the, the corn phase of this rotation. Uh, and you can see here the nitrogen distribution through the profiles. This is 100 centimeters here. Um, I'm, I tried to get all in English units and I didn't get it all, sorry about that. But, um, but here you can see this is pounds of nitrogen in the profile. So you can see that between the early and the late kill, there's not really a difference, and there shouldn't be, right? Because this is in the spring. This is late March. So we have, there is no difference between these two just yet. Even though there's a little artifact here, there's really no significant difference between these two because this is in the spring, just as we're about to kill that early cover crop. So this had no cover crop. This had a small cover crop up to this point, and you can see the difference in the amount of nitrogen, 45 pounds versus 30 pounds of N in that biomass that you're taking out of the system. Now, look, let's just look at how this behaves uh, as we move uh, into later into May. So now we're killing the big cover crop. So the early kill cover crop was already killed a while ago. Now we're at early May. And so you can see the difference again, 33, 25, 11. Look at how much more nitrogen we're taking out of the soil profile as we delay management. I think that was a really important point that Shalimar made, which is we focus so much on fall nitrogen when it comes to water quality. Spring nitrogen is a pretty big deal. There's a lot of it out there. The soils are warming. We have to worry about that mineral nitrogen. And you can see here, just from a cover crop that was killed in uh, uh, early to mid-March versus a cover crop here that was killed in May, you can see the difference in how much more N it's pulling out of the system, and obviously you can contrast that to the bare ground. So what is this cover crop doing? So this is a, t this is a complicated figure because it's not totally correct. Right? So I just wanted to make sure everybody knows that this isn't correct here. So we're looking at the proportion of the biomass of the cover crop that's decomposing over time. But remember, the late kill was killed later, right? So these were not killed on the same date. This, this solid line was killed a month or so later. So you're just looking at the proportion of the decomposition of this cover crop on the same axis and like it's lined up on growing degree days. But you can see, for example, the difference of where we have data, the idea here is that this was in the field a lot longer. And the point is, is that these small cover crops killed early have a very high CN ratio. Look at this. This, was, this is in a couple of weeks. Most of the biomass is, is decomposing. The nitrogen is released out of that system. This is not a major player. If you're killing this in early March to mid-March, by the time, at least for us, when we're planting at the end of April, early May, this is not a major driver in our nitrogen dynamics in our system. Whereas this cover crop is. As you have this bigger cover crop, obviously you have to kill it later, so it's persisting longer, plus it's got all that carbon in that system right when you're planting that cash crop. And that can tie up the nitrogen, and that's where you get more of a challenge in that end management. And this is just to accentuate the point. So now we're not looking at different timings. This is all the same time. This is just shoot biomass. So this is just above ground cereal rye tissue put on the surface and how it behaves, how it decomposes. And this is done in North Carolina and Maryland and the data's pooled here. And so this just makes the point if you got, you know, that this is what a lot of us are seeing here. And you can see very little decay at 2000. It doesn't change much over the growing season. It kind of hangs out there. It doesn't, it's, I mean, what we were looking at earlier, those smaller cover crops were like in the 800 to 1500 range. But you can see it's not a fast decomposition. As you get more biomass, you do get a faster decomposition rate, but you obviously don't decompose all the biomass. What you're left with here, the higher you are, the more biomass you have at the end of the season, right? So this is just days after planting. And so the point of why you see a little bit more of a slope here is because all of a sudden now, when the cover crop gets huge like this, and most of us don't see cover, most of us, if we're pushing cover crop biomass, are not much more than this range here. So this is real extreme, but we like to test extremes just to see how this performs. And you can see that as you start to get more, the cover crop mulch starts to behave almost like a soil, right? It's like it's got its own insulation factor. When a surface, when you've got just a 
cover crop that's just a couple of tillers on the surface, it's changing its temperature and moisture regimes rapidly. The dew comes on, it gets soaking wet. You know, during the day it dries out, it's hot, it's cold. Those conditions are not very hospitable for microbes. They don't like to live under those conditions as much, so it's a little bit tougher to live in that condition. Whereas if you've got a big, heavy, thick mulch, the thicker the mulch gets, the more it insulates itself, and so you can get a little bit of a faster decomposition, but I think this is more academic because most of us are not dealing with that kind of biomass levels. Okay, so now let's put them together, grasses and legumes, and just let's look how they behave in tillage versus no-till based systems so that we're, you know, we can get a sense for how, how the nitrogen is released. So now we were looking at decomposition earlier, just how much biomass was reduced. Now we're looking at nitrogen. So this is just nitrogen release. So the bigger it gets, the more N you get into the system. And so this is a typical side dress time right here, right, V7. So this just gives you a sense if you've got a pure hairy veg cover crop, this is a tillage-based system, um, that most of that nitrogen explodes within 15 days. So 15 days of that legume being incorporated into the soil, the vast majority of that nitrogen is in a soluble form, it's a leachable form, I mean it may be tied up in microbes, there's different states that that, it's not just like in soil solution leaving the system, obviously there's all these different cycling of nutrients going on as it moves down the profile, but the point is, is that all that nitrogen is available very early on. And as we start to think about optimal nutrient management and we're trying to you know, synchronize our N availability with N uptake of the cash crop, we would like most of that nitrogen to not be just exploded so early on before that uh, cash crop is even growing. We'd like to see it more slower release. Now in the case of the mixtures, you can see it just has less nitrogen. Now this is a grass legume mixture where 50% of the biomass is the legume. It's a hairy vetch and 50% of it is rye. And what's interesting is that when you have a 50-50 ratio of the total biomass of the legume and the grass, it actually has the same amount of total nitrogen. So if you took all that plant tissue and you took a rye vetch mixture and you took a pure vetch over here and you added up the total biomass and it's how much nitrogen is in there, there's a total nitrogen is the same. But the actual release rate, how much nitrogen comes out of that cover crop during the growing season is quite different, right? So there's a lot less coming out in the mixture than there is in the monoculture because it, of the quality of the material. The CN ratio changes. Once you add rye in with the legume, you change that carbon to nitrogen ratio and you slow down that decomposition. And here's the pure rye at the bottom. Now when we look at a no-till application, you can see it behaves quite differently. We get better synchrony with that nitrogen with crop uptake. So now that pure legume sitting on the surface, it's under this inhospitable environment, right? It's just hanging out on the surface. It gets wet in the morning. It dries out in the afternoon. Fungi don't love those wild, crazy conditions. So they're a little bit slower to decompose. And you can see a slower release pattern now. And that applies for all of them. Just that in a no-till application, these cover crops release their nutrients slower and it's more synchronized with crop uptake. 10 minutes, Steven. 10 minutes, okay. I think that'll do it, okay. So let's, put, let's put, add another twist to this. So this is a paper we got published a couple years ago where we did this continuum. This, this previous slide is kind of like my cartoon version of this. And so this is what was published. And so up here is a pure vetch. I'm sorry, this is pure rye. And this is pure vetch down here. And this, these are just, these are the same sites, the same treatments. I'll explain the difference in a second. And then all these little lines in between just represent ratios of grass legume mixtures. That as you go up, the grass concentration increases. As you go down, the legume concentration increases in that mixture. And then this is just the decomposition over time of those cover crops. And the point here is, again, as I said, obviously, we, we, we talked about the pure rye versus the pure vetch and the de decomposition pattern. Now look what happens when we add poultry litter. So if you're broadcasting poultry litter over the surface of this cover crop in this no-till application, you're going to get faster decomposition, particularly in the dominated grass biomass. If you've got a lot more grass in that system, the, the poultry litter really has a big effect. If you're mostly a legume, the poultry litter doesn't have that big of an effect on decomposition. And you can see the difference between these two, and that is the effect of adding poultry litter.
So where are we going with this? So we, I talked a lot about kind of these, this, the uh, nitrogen decomposition and release availability. We'd like to be providing decision support tools to growers uh, like yourself in the room uh, to help guide you in decision making about how much nitrogen is going to be in your system based on your cover crop management. So that you can go out in your field, you can take a small little grab bag sample of your cover crop, you can shoot it over to our lab, we do a quick assay of that, and then we can give you release patterns of nutrients in your system so you can adjust your management based on that. And ideally we'll have climate uh, uh, integrated into these models so that it's real time updating so that if you got a flood, you know, in May, you know, a week or two after you plant it and you put down a bunch of uh, um, starter, then you're going to have to adjust for your side dress applications. I mean, for where we are, folks are doing a lot of starter side dress split application rates. I know that's not common everywhere, but that's pretty common in our region. And that allows me to tie into another point I wanted to make, which I didn't bring any slides about our allelopathy data, but we do have quite a bit of allelopathy data. And I would say allelopathy is used way too much. That allelopathy is this black box everybody likes to throw things into and say, okay, was this allelopathic effect? I think that we saw a slide last year at the Midwest Cover Crop Council that was showing disease incidence. I think there's a disease factor here. I think it has a lot to do with our planter technology, being able to get optimal seed placement and good seed to soil contact and uniform placement. Because for most of these systems we're working in, allelopathic chemicals are gone well before we're planting in there with our cash crops. These early tillering cover crops, so we do a bunch of these studies. First of all, very little to know of the allelochemical content of the shoots makes it into the soil, which kind of blew my mind, but there's very little allelochemicals coming from the shoots. It's all about the roots. The roots are providing the, the vast majority of the allelochemicals in the system, and of what the roots are providing, those allelochemicals are gone rapidly. We're, not, we're talking days, weeks, we're not talking about months. So if you're planting your cash crop four to eight weeks later, the likelihood that this has anything to do with allelopathy is quite low. That there's a lot of other factors that we're still figuring out. Definitely, I think a lot of it has to do with this nitrogen. As we start to increase these biomass levels, we're going to need to offset and compensate at our planting. Now, if you're in a system where you're putting all your nitrogen down at planting, then by and large, you should not have a problem. We've got a number of studies that show that as long as you're, if you're putting down a full rate of N at planting, even with these bigger cover crops, you're not really getting a yield penalty for the most part. You may, in some systems, need to compensate and add a little bit more as far as total N. But really for us, where it comes down to is the split applications. We're putting down about 15 to 30% of our N at planting. So if, you know, if you're putting down 150 pounds of N, we're putting down 30 pounds, 20 pounds of N at planting. We're getting overwhelmed in that kind of a system. So if we've got like biomass, two, three, four thousand pounds per acre of rye biomass out there, we need to be looking at closer to 50 to 75 pounds of nitrogen at planting to compensate for that nitrogen immobilization. We're working through these details. We've got to study up and down the East Coast to see, you know, is this a total nitrogen game or is this just the distribution of starter and side dress? But we think that a lot of this is mostly just that distribution that you can over, because a lot of the past work that's been done on this has shown that if you've got, you know, 200 pounds of nitrogen out there planting, you're not seeing yield penalties even with some of these bigger cover crops. And there's a number of studies that have been out there in the literature for a while. So this is where we're going with these decision tools. We're, doing a, we're calibrating tools by doing a lot of this on-farm decomposition. We're on sites all up and down the East Coast doing this work. We're doing complete water budgets and water infiltration dynamics to study how water is infiltrating into the system and how that affects N availability. Um, and, uh, and so this is just kind of examples of what looks that on farm. And um, this is the Georgia calculator that we're working with to kind of build and, and, uh, and expand on. Uh, and, and so we're taking the tool that they've developed and calibrating it for a broader region. And we hope to expand and, and partner with folks like the Soul Health Partnership to expand the application and the inference to the, the Midwest. But it gives you things like this, or it gives you end release curves to get, you know, we get assess of how, what your end is going to be like based on your cover crop and your biomass and its quality.